PC, accounting for your future. Hopefully you're working. This is uh, F8 uh, session one. Welcome to the online uh, systems. Uh, my name is Alan. I'm going to take you through some of the F8 as an introduction. Uh, particularly, we've got an agenda here. Uh, to start off with, uh, what is an audit? Because you're doing F8, you may not have come across auditors before and they're very strange people and you might want to know what is going on with them. So I'll try and take you through what an audit is first, uh, as an overview anyway. Uh, we'll have a quick look at the F8 syllabus and see what's in there, what you've got to learn. We'll look at the uh, F8 exam format, so you know what you're faced with when you take the examination. We'll also try and just go for an audit in overview, so you know how the different bits of the syllabus are going to fit together. And then finally, we'll just do a quick summary to make sure you're happy with uh, F8 and uh, ready for the next session, we can start to hopefully uh, learn some detail of the syllabus itself. To start off with those, I just think about what an audit is, if you haven't come across auditors before. Um, it's strange in a way, but <clears throat> if you just think about uh, what auditors do, that's part of what this exam is all about, is trying to understand their process and uh, the reason for them being in existence. Um, just just think about it this way. Let's have a little example of uh, what um, auditors might be. Now, um, this, 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 this is going to be drawing. This, this could be fun. We'll see how we get on it anyway. Right. All right. Uh, here we go. Uh, guess what the object is going to be. Right, and this is going to be relevant to audit, trust me, okay? Here we go. Now, you've got to assume that this is now effectively your dream car, all right? It's a second-hand car, by the way. And here we go. Okay. There's the current owner of the car. And that owner is thinking, yeah, um, what am I going to do? Bought, bought. And he wants to go and sell the car because he wants some money. I'll put UK power for now because that's easier. Okay, so you're going to sell the car. And, and you're thinking, ah, let's have somebody else over here. Stick people are fun, aren't they? There we go. Okay, and you're thinking, okay, here's your thought bubble, effectively. Ah, wow, car, oh. and want to buy it. So, it's going along and give the give. Are you going along and give the cash to the owner, or are you going to get the the car checked first? In other words, what you might want to do now in England, there's various organisations called like the RAC. You'd go to to say, can you check this car, please? Well, let's just assume we've got somebody similar to that. So here's a third party. Right, this person is right a mechanic, and what that mechanic is going to do is effectively check the car to make sure it's roadworthy. And you know, the mechanic can do that for two very good reasons because why can the mechanic do this? Number one. He's got a qualification, so he knows how to look at cars to make sure that they're actually okay. And two, he's got some form of checklist, which is there uh, just as a reminder of all things got to be checked to make sure that the car is roadworthy. So what you do is you talk to the mechanic and say, can you please check this car? The mechanic says, yes. I know what I'm doing because I've got a qualification so I have to check if anything is wrong with that car. Two, I've actually got a list of things that I'm going to do. The 50 or 60 points I'm going to make sure this car is correct before it's going roadworthy. And then yes, what I would do when I finish that is I'll finally give you a report on how good that, rip that car is. So you will know whether or not it's actually worth buying that car. The other thing that's good about that report, of course, it is completely independent of the owner. The owner is over here or by themselves, as it were. All right, but it's you and the mechanic are talking to each other to make sure the car is correct. 
so you can trust the mechanic again because they're not related hopefully to the owner of the car at the moment so if the car is okay you can say yes thank you mechanic very much here's your fee then you can go back to the owner over here and say yeah thank you very much i'll buy the car i know it's roadworthy it's safe whatever else it is and actually that's an audit because what happens in an audit is the directors of the company produce some financial statements uh, aka that's actually the car so here's the directors all right they produce financial statements of the car we don't know those financial statements are actually any good so what we do is we say to the auditors can you check those financial statements for us the same as the mechanic checks the car so the auditors say yeah 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 not a problem we can do this because we've got a qualification we know what we're doing as auditors and we can do this because we've got a checklist standards things we've got to follow so we know what we're doing and so then go away check the financial statements come back and then give you a report in this case an audit report on how good those financial statements are and if they're okay the audit report will say yeah not a problem if there's problems then it will really detail those so the users of the financial statements know about that so just in the same way as the mechanic would say hey up there's a problem with the car I would tell you so the auditors will do the same if there's a problem with the financial statements so we've got exactly the same process going on and just to be clear there we go there's a new page what we now have in fact is the directors of a company okay they've produced the financial statements okay those financial statements are going to go to the use of the financial statements basically the shareholders but the shareholders don't know those financial statements are correct so what they do they get the auditor to effectively audit or review those financial statements to make sure that they are right the auditor can do that for two reasons one as a qualification two there are some standards of work he's got to follow a checklist and so on we'll come back to these they're actually called the international standards of auditing we'll come back to those that's a standard and you know he can follow those and therefore can make sure the five statements are correct and when it's finished that report will go down to the shareholders the users so they know the financial statements are right correct and all this works because the auditor and the directors are different people they're not related they're independent in, in audit terms so you know you can trust the auditor so that's it in a nutshell that is really what's happening with an audit you can argue auditors are not particularly exciting people because all they're doing is checking things all the time but that, that's up to you uh, they're actually doing a very important job by making sure that these things the financial statements are produced by companies are actually accurate they are correct and therefore the shareholders can rely on them so there we are there at the beginning that's an audit which hopefully helps just a little bit but we will see so not that one that one there we go there we are that's what we've done what is an audit and the answer to that is basically if I could spell the roof the roof of <coughs> the five statements by a qualified auditor to ensure those statements are correct and that's what we're going to be looking at so a lot of this FA syllabus we'll come on to next is taking you through very basically what an auditor does in the purpose of it afford or to get this review correct if you like so 
if we just have a look at the syllabus, this is online. You can download it from the ACCA website if you want to. Probably a good idea, so you know what's going on there. <clears throat> and we'll go for the exam structure later. We'll go for the, ac the assessment systems later. This is where we start. It's about page three or so of this nice ACCA document. Let's go back up a little bit. It says basically, here's where Audit and Assurance sits, paper F8. You've already done a bit of company law. You've been hopefully doing a bit of financial reporting as well. And those papers feed into audits. We need to know a bit about company law because auditors are governed to a certain extent by the Companies Act. We need to know a bit about financial reporting because auditors do know to know, need to know their financial reporting standards so they can actually uh, ensure the final statements are right. And that's what AA says. If you're going to go on with AA, this will then take you into AAA, Advanced Audit and Assurance Later, Paper P7. And that's the one you're going to have to take if you want to actually be an auditor and manage jurisdictions. But there's also a feed across to the professional accounts of Paper P1. And in Paper P1, that's mainly the ethics and the governance systems that are going to be introduced in AA will be examined, expanded, examined in more detail in Professional Accountant PA, uh, Paper P1. So that's where, that's where all it is. The main things you've got to do in this paper um, is basically explain the concept of audit and assurance. Part of that we've already done with our review to make sure that um, our car was roadworthy and our overview of the audits. There's a bit of function of the audit corporate governors also thrown in there for good measure, as well as ethics. Which ethics seems to go into many papers nowadays anyway. We'll need to look at that in more detail. We'll need to look then how the auditor obtains and accepts assurance engagements, because all, there's a specific way that auditors get that information. We'll get those engagements, we need to find out what they are. We'll need to find out how auditors actually do audit testing. And there are two sorts of evidence they can collect. And we'll come back to that shortly to see what that is, at least an overview. It's going to be internal controls and also substantive testing. D takes you into the other evidence they can collect, which is partly substantive evidence. And also they apply these international standards of auditing. Remember that's their rule book. It's the things they've got to make sure are correct, their method of work if you like, from our overview, and we'll see those. And as we get towards the end of the audit, there's all sorts of interesting things going on, subsequent events, going concern principles and so on. I need to make sure that those things have been satisfied before we finally produce our audit report right at the end of the audit. And that's supposed to be summarised in that little diagram. There we are. There is audit. There is a bit of regulation, framework work we've got to look at. We have got to do some planning and risk assessment at the beginning of the audit on our clients, as we'll see. We've got to check the internal controls. We've got to collect audit evidence. Then we've got to review and then report back to the members on how good the financial statements are. The detailed syllabus is, is actually you know, very detailed, as you would expect. I won't spend too much time going through it because it's summarised and then gets again in more detail again. Let's just have a look at the summary of the summary, if you like this one. You can go through the detail later if you want to. Uh, basically, we do need to know about an audit. We said this one. External audits, the one we're looking at, this is where the auditor comes in and makes sure the financial statements are right. There's a bit about corporate governance in there, particularly about audit committees we'll need to look at. There is the ACA Code of Ethics. And that's, that will be examined here. It also gets examined in P1 and P7 of the papers anyway. There's a bit about the people at work for a company, the internal auditors and what they do. And there's overall the scope of the internal audit function in detail and what they do in a company. But if we find out what external auditors do, they're the people that come in and check the end of year accounts, then we should be fairly happy. We know what the internal auditors are going to do as well as their work is roughly, roughly the same. We also got to do some planning, and that looks at the beginning of the audit, assuming we've got our audit client, and what we do is we try to, say, to see how risky that client is going to be. That means it depend, that will then affect how much work and evidence we're going to collect. 
that's a fairly important part of the audit. If you've got a fairly risky client, then you might want, you'll need to do more work. Or in some situations, the auditor may not actually take the client on in the first, first place. So we've got to do this planning and risk assessment, very important part of the auditor's job. Uh, we will assess those risks and see how bad they're going to be. We'll look at the entity, that's the, the company being audited, which will help us decide how bad those risks are. We'll need to consider where there's any fraud taking place, unfortunately. If there is, you might want to not audit the clients and then document all that in some way. Big firms, big audit firms will have computers to do all this for us. We'll still be using, unfortunately, pen and paper, obviously. The, the documentation playing there won't be too onerous, but we have got to try to make sure we know that we've got all the information we need, whether to go into the audit. And if we go into the audit, there are then two ways or two things we've got to do. Firstly, we've got to look at the internal control systems. Uh, those are the things in a company that try to make sure that all the transactions are being recorded correctly. So there'll be literally controls in there that we can look at, evaluate and test to make sure that those controls are accurate, they are working. It's like if goods are being received into a company, so a manufacturing company has, has, has actually ordered some goods, when those goods come in the door, they'll be compared to the document that comes with them, which is called basically a goods um, dispatch note and a goods receipt note in the company. That note will say how many items should be received. Somebody in the company will then look at the goods and basically count them to make sure they're all there and then sign that document to say, yep, yeah, I've done the check, all the goods are there. Exactly the same if a courier comes to your door with a parcel and says, please sign for the parcel. And you say, yeah, OK, and sign for the parcel. That's a control in that the courier now knows you've received the parcel, the same as the company now knows they've received the right quantity of goods. What the auditor will then do with that control is actually look for the signature. So if they want to prove you've received the parcel, they'll look for your signature on the, the systems that the courier has got probably gone into a computer somewhere or in a company they'll look for the goods receipt notes and the signature of the person counting the goods in and that proves then those goods have been received and there'll be lots of controls like that we'll go through as we go through the syllabus and we'll have to see how they operate and how we test them that's a big part of the syllabus internal controls it's seeing the controls the company has put up itself to make sure that the systems are working correctly alternatively we can actually collect other sorts of audit evidence, which is part and dear of the syllabus, where we effectively ignore the controls. And what we say there is, OK, there'll be other audit procedures we can use to make sure the systems are, <coughs> are working. If you think about these goods coming into the company, we can look at the control on the goods receipt note to make sure the goods are correct. The other thing we could do is actually count the goods ourselves. So the auditors will, may want to attend the company, the goods in was Bay, and actually physically count to those goods coming in and make sure that they do agree to the goods, the goods uh, receipt note. And that's the alternative way we could get evidence. It's called substantive procedures or audit procedures. It ignores the control system and just makes sure then the systems are working by actually verifying those directly. And that's the other big part of the syllabus, is all the audit procedures involved in doing that. It does get a bit more complex because there is audit sampling involved in that one, where we try to find out, um, we'll try to decide how many items to test. There's detail on specific items that we'll need to go through, because some bits of the statement of financial position, we will actually audit substantially, almost completely and we'll look at the specific tests involved in that one. There's a little bit about computers, uh, not a lot to be fair, because it, again, a large firm, a lot of this stuff will now be online, it'll be on computer systems, and the audit firm will use computers to audit the client's computers. Um, we can't be that in an exam, so a lot of this won't be computer-based as such. We just need to know the background to computer-assisted audit techniques, 
not the detail, fortunately. There's also a little bit more about um, other sources of evidence for us, like relying on the work of others, and we'll see that one. And there's a little bit about not-for-profit. To be fair, most of this syllabus uh, affects profit-making organisations, but the same procedures on audit can also be applied to not-for-profit organisations, as we will see. Finally, you get towards the end of the audit, and then there's a bit called review and auditing, and there's some very specific things we have to do. We have to make sure that the accounts are correct. Nothing after the end of the year affects them. We may have done subsequent events already in S7, so that they're going to come back. We do need to make sure that the client, the entity, is what's called a going concern, that it will be there for, in our terminology, the foreseeable future, because if not, that will affect the audit report, so we'll be checking that. And we also need to collect written representations from our client, which are basically the directors giving us more information, more evidence to confirm various things. Hopefully then if it's correct, and we'll do a final review of the file before finally we can issue our audit report. And really any or all of those errors in the syllabus can be examined. Obviously because it's in the syllabus. But to be fair, the larger questions, and we'll go into questions in a few minutes, will normally, normally revolve around C and D there, the, the, the tests of the controls and the collection of substantive evidence. So that, that's the syllabus, at least in overview of what you've got to know about. It looks daunting to a certain extent, but a lot of these things are, are relatively straightforward if you know if you know the techniques for auditing one area, the same sort of idea will apply to the other. Uh, by all means, have a look at the detail of the syllabus there. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's helpful to an extent, but uh, we will be going back for the obviously as we go through these tutorials. Right, so there's part two. I'm just going to put a book on the floor out of the way. So that's it, the F8 syllabus. There it is, five main areas. Okay, and basically it follows a, if you like, a, if there is such a thing, a, a standard audit from beginning to end. So that's the second bit of the syllabus, or second bit of our objectives. So we will go through all those obviously as we go through the detail in following sessions. Right, we also need to know then about the exam format. Here's the uh, the exam the specimen paper for F8. F8 did actually change its format in December 2014, last December. So there's not many past papers to go on in the same format. But the December ones are on the ACA website. I assume the answers will be fairly soon as well. So now let's just go through this paper the example paper, just to see the sort of questions you're going to get is the point, not to answer them in detail. So what you get to start off with in section A, it says 12 cash flow compulsory and must be attempted. And the answer you can see some form of multiple choice or multiple objective testing. So you're going to get a very basic question. There we are. Which of the sampling methods correctly describes systematic sampling? Okay, we don't know yet. And there's three options. And you've got to sort out whether it's going to be A or B or C for one mark. Some of those get just a little bit more complicated. So number two there, there's the audit juniors assigned to the audit of bank and cash balances of the company. You obtain the following evidence. And the question is, what is the order of reliability of the audit evidence starting with the most reliable first? So we'd have to look at the four options and decide how reliable each of those are and then get hopefully the right order. So is it going to be four or two first? And then having decided that, we then go further down the objective testing options. And I say four or two first because A is four, C is four, B is two and D is two. So the first thing we've got to look at is which is more reliable. 
Is it a bank confirmation report from Howard's bankers, or is it a cash count carried out by the audit junior? And if we look at uh, make a decision on that, we can then go forward to decide which other ones are more reliable. But as that's a more complicated question, they are around their two marks. So you get one mark to just really choose one from three or four. The two marks are going to take a little more time to go through. And that's question three is a two mark. Question four, a bit more, a bit, bit quicker to read, but still two. Same with five, and you see it's uh, matching these things together. Well, some of them are, are very straightforward. 50-50 uh, chance of getting it right, true or false. When placing reliance on the work of an expert, is the following statement true or false? And if you're going to place reliance, you're also required to validate work performed by the experts. So A will say true, B will say false, one mark. Hopefully we can get that sort of thing right, we will see. But there's your first 12 questions. They're all objective testing, and they're all worth then one or two marks. We then go a bit further forward, and we see the second sort of question here in section B. All six questions are compulsory and must be attempted. And we've now got questions worth 10 marks. 10 marks of two, three, 10 marks, 10 marks of four, and then five, you'll see it's even bigger question that's worth 20 marks, the same as question six. So we've got two sorts of written question, 10 marks and 20 markers. The written ones tend to be a little, the, the 10 markers, sorry, tend to be a little bit briefer than the 20 markers, obviously. There's less, there's less detail, less marks. And they sent it a little bit more factual, although you've got to look to a certain extent at the scenarios there to understand what's going on. Let's look at the question two, for example, though. There we are. There's a little bit of factual to start off with. Try and highlight the right bit. There we go. Auditors are required to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Tests and controllers of standard procedures can be used to obtain said evidence. And we've got to define test and control and substantive procedure. We've already seen those to an extent already in the on our previous chat about the syllabus. A test of controlled looking at controllers already there, making sure it's been actually used. So standard procedure review really performance. So we could almost start to answer that now. Well, we're not going to, but you can see the idea. So it's a very basic facts coming through, as well as then some more scenario based. There we are. Describe substantive procedures to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence in relation to the above two issues. Substantive being, as we know, the sort of the re-performance of checking of things. So while there is a couple of things happening there, we will need to say what those procedures are. The rule of thumb, about one mark per, per e for each of those procedures. So eight procedures will get us four marks, as it were. That's the sort of thing we'll be thinking about. So there is small scenarios as you go further forward to question five and six, the scenario gets a bit more chunky. So you've got to read a lot more to be able to get into the answers. Some of those are, interestingly, calculation. So there's the calculation of ratios. So we need to look at what you're given and then decide which ratio to calculate and calculate them. There's, num there's actually marks for that calculation. Those sort of things come up occasionally in F8, as well as review of the information about the ratios calculated, six audit risks, and explain the, the response to those risks and the planning, the auditors, Walters and Co. So just do a quick check here. We've got 12 marks. We've got six risks we're looking for, and we've got to describe those risks and explain the response to those to each of those risks. So you might be able to see the answer format could be easily tabular and across. Let's just uh, put that up for example. If you're going to do this as an answer, we can see straight away that what we might want to do is actually something like this. There's the audit risk. And response to risk and if we're getting six of those 
we can easily explain the risk and the response in a nice way so the examiner can actually read that hopefully fairly quickly and, and give us lots of marks so don't don't forget please even from the beginning when you start to look at questions you need to think about how you're going to answer them and that'll be an easy way of doing that one tabulation six risks and six responses there we go six risks and six responses right so at the end of the day, uh, we've got the, the last one there, describe the procedures the Auditor of Walters Co. should perform in assessing whether or not the companies are going concern, and about five procedures there will be fine. There's five marks. So again, we're thinking straight away. There's the number of marks. That's the number of things that we've actually got to do. So there's the questions. Oh, another one as well. Exactly the same idea. Identify and explain six deficiencies a control to address those, and a test of control that soirees, whoever that is, can actually use to do that. So I can call, presume, is the audit firm. And that's 18 marks. So six deficiencies, six controls, six tests of controls, 18 marks. You can see where that one's going. So we've got three columns now with the deficiency. It's first, the test of control, the second. Sorry, the, the control to address those, and the test in the third. So nice format again of answer. As you just go into the actual exam answers from ACCA, you'll see that um, we have got all the multiple choice. So the objective testing ones there. A little bit of explanation. Then we are straight away into number two. In fact, they've even got there section B. Sorry, question one. There's a table. So again, they're actually saying this is a good way to do the answer. Um, even some of the others here, and we are for question two of substantive procedures, we don't need to write a lot necessarily, and there's just bullet point answers there. Each one is a full procedure, of course, but you don't need to actually write, if you like, lots and lots of long paragraphs for this. Each of those bullet points there is a procedure, and they'll each be worth one mark. So they're, there. they're going straight forward to do. Format of, of, of an F8 answer is not necessarily what you expect. This is not a discursive answer. It's putting things down quickly and succinctly. And if you go further forward, there's the ratio one we're talking about. There we are, audit risk, audit response. A nice, uh, easy format to produce. And to be fair, also nice and easy for the marker to mark. And the last one there, there we are, deficiency control test of control, get the format sorted out, and again it makes it easy for you to write out the answer and easy for excuse me, the marker to be able to mark it. And yes, there is a marker scheme at the end. And you'll see most of the time it does work exactly as we suggested. There we are. One mark per relevant procedure up to max of four marks for each issue. So they're saying uh, eight marks for procedures. It's probably going to be, in this case, four marks for the first batch and four marks for the second. Two fours give us the eight marks. One mark for each well described point and more discursive one. And again, in 4B, one mark per relevant substantive procedure. So don't need to write very much necessarily. It's just writing the right things that's obviously going to get you the marks there. Okay, so there it is. There's the exam format, and you'll see basically there are some objective que testing questions, then <coughs> written questions, 10 or 20 marks, and you've got to get you've got to answer all of those. Um, you can't just unfortunately leave some out. Okay, F8, it's compulsory, all, answer, all questions must be answered, right. So we now know, so we need to scroll back up a little bit. Okay, an audit is basically somebody checking the financial statements. That's the auditor checking the financial statements to make sure they're correct. Very same as a, a mechanic checks a car to make sure it's actually roadworthy. Um, the syllabus itself has five main areas, and that tends to work through an audit. Uh, the exam, well, that's an audit in, in the real world, as it were. Perhaps a little bit simplistic, but there again, uh, we're not meant to be 
detailed autos at the moment. And then thirdly, there's the F8 exam format, and you've got some objective testing in there, and you've got some short and some longer written questions. Right, let's just have a look now at the, at the audit uh, in a slightly different way regarding the overview. I'm just going to put a, another page onto my journal here. Um, the key thing to remember here is that uh, we're looking at lots of facts in this paper, as well as just making sure that we can write things out fairly quickly. Uh, but we also know, or we can bluff, that we know what an audit is. And if we know roughly what an audit is, then that's going to help us. You actually need to work in audit for, an audit firm to pass this paper. You just need to know, sort of, in overview, what auditors do. So I'm trying to get a drink. So let's just think what we know a little bit so far, and just try to get the main stages of an audit, and what happens then. And we can then keep coming back and revisiting this as we go through different sessions, just to make sure that we know where we are in the audit. So, what an auditor does to start off with, he actually needs an audit engagement, as it were. Okay, and it doesn't just take anybody, as it were. What we have there is what we call client acceptance procedures. We will need to make sure that our client is basically needs an audit knows what you want, and the client is over you is not too risky. Or at least we can, ident we can identify the basic risks there. When we start to think about whether you actually want to be as an audit firm, whether you want to be the auditors of a particular company. So that's the beginning. We need to find out who our clients are. Not only that, <coughs> but we'll need to be thinking of things about ethics and so on to make sure we can actually perform that audit. You'll recall, I said, you need to be independent. Right, that was a key word there of the, of the client or the directors. That will be the case. We'll always need to make sure they're independent and therefore there will always be ethics to worry about and we'll come back to those ethics later right, I'll just get the black pen back again right when we've decided on our clients had actually been accepted as auditors we'll then do some planning what we're actually looking for here is, is two things. Okay, there will be the standard audit that we're going to carry out, no doubt about it. But actually, what we're looking for here, again, is the specific risks for this client. Because that will start to focus how we're going to do the audit. Uh, for example, if our client is taking lots of cash, you make a lot of cash sales to people, then a specific risk straight away will be that cash might be nicked or might be lost. And so that's going to flavor or direct us to look at the, the systems in the client to make sure that cash is not lost. So there's a specific risk. And that will straight away hit, therefore, a response. The auditor were thinking straight away how that's going to affect the testing, as in uh, the specific audit procedures we're going to use to make sure these risks haven't occurred. So there's planning. That will then move into basically evidence collection. So we'll be collecting evidence to make sure that the, these risks, I feel like, are minimised or haven't happened. And as you may guess, the sorts of evidence we can collect at this stage are tests of controls, which I don't think I can't spell right. There we go. And also 
substantive testing. So if we're worried about uh, the cache of the client, for example, we may actually see that the cache is reconciled to the till at the end of the day and somebody signs for that one, so that'll be a control. Or we might want to count that cache ourselves and reconcile it back to what the till says at the end of the day, which would be a substantive test. So the planning is identified the risk, the evidence collection, then gives us all the evidence to determine if that risk has actually occurred or not. Hopefully it hasn't, and we've got evidence to prove that. Uh, if it has, we're going to have a problem, and that will help hit the audit report, as we'll see in a few minutes. All right, but that's how these things start to link. The planning gives us the risks of the particular client. The evidence, the audit evidence we collect, then says whether well, those risks have actually crystallized, if those risks are actually, if you like, real or not. We then go through having collected that evidence towards the end of the audit. And at the end of the audit, there's some very specific things that we have to do. They are mentioned in the syllabus again. We are looking to a post balance sheet event. So I'll just write that as PBSE for now. So in other words, there might be things that occur after the financial statement date, the year end date, that still affect those financial statements. And we'll be doing reviews to try to make sure those things are correctly reflected in the financial statements as necessary. And for example, if a company has got a lot of receivables, we may find that just after the end of the year, one of those receivables goes bust or into liquidation. That would mean that the receivable in our financial statements is overstated. So the post balance sheet event, that receivable going bust, basically means we need to go back to our financial statements and adjust for that. So post balance sheet events we'll be looking for, to make, and actually they're making sure the financial statements are corrected for those. We'll also be looking at going concern to make sure our entity will be able to continue into the foreseeable future. So we'll be collecting other evidence to make sure basically the client is going to be stable and will continue to be there. So we know <coughs> that our report is correct and the assets and liabilities are also correct to the point of going concern. If the company is not a going concern, then presumably it's going to have more liabilities for your assets, for example. So we're also doing a going concern review. And we'll also be getting representations from directors on bits of evidence that we're not completely happy with, as it were. I should say from, should it? I'll just, just change that back again. There we go. All right, that should say, that should say from, that's better. All right, so some things you need to make sure the directors are happy with and they represent to us that in a letter. Um, so, for example, they've chosen some depreciation rates and that from the directors will simply confirm that that choice was theirs and those rates are basically what they wanted and about correct. There's no other way we can check that. All right, so end of the audit, some very specific things we do before we finally issue the audit report. Again, there's a bunch of ISAs, international uh, standard and auditing that could govern that one, but we'll be look, we need to look at various forms of reports. Hopefully, our report will be what we call unmodified. So it's a nice clean report, everything is okay. If not, we'll need to look at the various sorts of modifications we can use to bring things to the member's attention, things are not necessarily correct. So it'd be unmodified or it might have modifications, and we'll go back later, of course, we study this to find out what those sort of modifications are. Hopefully it'll be all right, but who knows, it may not be. And that's it. We sign the audit report. We give that to the, the company. The company's hopefully happy. The shareholders are happy because they know their investment is all right. The accounts are correct. Uh, the audit gets paid. So the auditor happy as well, and then everything goes quiet until the next year's audit. 
I mean, overview, that's the audit and the things we need to look at from the point of view of this syllabus. Again, so I think the audit starts, the engagement, make sure you're happy with the client. We do some planning to identify the risks of the client because that focuses our mind on those APC, risks and tells us where to collect evidence. Accounting for your we then future. collect evidence using tests and controls of substantive evidence. And even after that, there'll still be specific areas that we need to look at like on the statement of financial position, where some tests will always be the same. So it's not just the risk per se we need to look at. There's also some very standard tests we need to go through and make sure we're happy with those. We then get to the end of the audit. Then there's some things we've always got to do, a post-balance due to parent review. We've always got to look at the going concern and collect representation of the directors before we put all that information together and say, right, how are those financial statements correct, accurate, about right? Sorry, I say about right because they can't necessarily be right to the nearest penny. So we'll just have another concept there called materiality we'll come back to to determine how accurate things have got to be. And then if the, the financial statements are accurate, we can issue a modify report. And if they're not, we'll think about how to modify that report to bring to the attention of the the members that there is a problem with those financial statements and that's it that's sort of the overview again of the audit and we'll keep coming back to that as we go through these sessions to see where we are so hopefully we know what we're doing in the audit itself so audit overview again the sort of <clears throat> that's the main areas of the audit spell and we'll keep coming back to that then to in each session to see where we are in the audit so that's that's nearly it the important thing to remember going into f8 is basically it is this okay auditors are important people if you like they're the mechanic, they're the people that are checking to make sure things are correct, in this case financial statements, and they've got the specific knowledge, the qualification to do that, and they've got the ISAs, the Interest Standards Auditing as the standard they're going to use to make sure that, those, that the uh, financial statements are right. If they are, then the members are going to be happy, the users. If they're not, the users are going to be warned by the specialist work of the auditor as to what the problems are. So you think about buying a second-hand car, you're doing exact, you're, you are employing effectively an auditor, you're employing a mechanic. The mechanic ensures the second-hand car is correct, while the, just moving up this page, the auditor makes sure the financial statements are correct. Exactly the same idea. So that's nearly it. What we'll start to do the next time then is go through those stages of the audit and to explain the specific work that's going to happen there and also how the auditor is going to respond to that and how that then falls into exam questions. That's all for now. I hope you've uh, learned a little bit about auditing there and the audit is not quite as scary as when we started. Right, I'll see you next time. Thank you very much. APC, accounting for your future.